turn next to a study of the thought of Bertrand Russell. Um, maybe the many thoughts of Bertrand Russell. He changed his mind about philosophical themes many times during the course of his lifetime. Uh, but we're focusing especially on uh, his er the earlier part of his career, the central part of his career, uh, and the development of a school of philosophy known as logical atomism. Now, unlike the label ordinary language philosophy, the logical atomists were very proud of this title. I think they invented it themselves. Uh, the idea was to try to find a perfect language where the atoms of the language, as it were, the simple sentences of the language, would mirror the simple facts, the states of affairs, the way things are in the world. Uh, but before we get to Russell's own theory about this, it uh, might be helpful to, um, to pause a moment and say something about the broader cultural context in which um, this, his thought was taking place. Um, I've said that, that Moore and Russell were colleagues at uh, Cambridge, and they were, but um, what intervened, obviously, uh, early in the 20th century here was World War I, um, known then, of course, just as the Great War, or the War to End All Wars. Um, and it had a profound effect, um, especially in England and Europe. Um, and there were several reactions to the war, or several ideas about what sort of the lessons were of the war. Um, one reaction was just a kind of general disenchantment with science and with politics alike, a kind of cynicism. Uh, so it replaced the enthusiasm and excitement of pre-war Europe about the power of capitalism and democracy coupled with the new technologies to solve every human problem. Um, as with organic life in the theory of evolution, the whole of civilization it was thought that at that time was going to continue to evolve into new and better forms of life and the ultimate elimination of all the social ills. And this would be aided primarily by these new developments in the sciences. Um, and the war uh, put quite a, a big break to that idea. Um, science was now in the service of, and technology was in the service of making more effective uh, ways to kill other people. Um, Science had not, in fact, uh, prevented the kinds of um, disputes, disagreements, um, territorial grabbing, and so forth that went with, uh, that precipitated the war. Um, and so there was a bit of a, a disillusionment that ran very deep for many people. Um, the, the writers Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald um, and their works represent, I think, this kind of disillusionment of what came to be called the lost generation. And uh, at this time, some existential philosophers then turned to talk about the absurd and about despair and themes of this sort. In fact, uh, Camus once claimed that the only interesting philosophical question was whether or not to commit suicide. Uh, so obviously, um, the culture in general had um, taken a darker turn, you might say, following the war. Um, on the other hand, and maybe it's um, easy to see this as part of the same thing in its own way, but there was also, as we moved into uh, the 1920s in this country, the United States, um, a kind of turn towards hedonism, right? It was known as the Roaring Twenties, you remember, and there was the sense that we should just uh, party on and uh, try to forget um, all of our troubles and uh, live at a much more superficial level and enjoy it while we can. Uh, because tomorrow we might die. Um, and pleasure um, doesn't disappoint, maybe, in the same way that uh, more serious pursuits seem to have disappointed some. So there's this kind of turn to uh, more superficial things, a kind of escapism, um, which uh, enabled, I think, some people to, um, to deal with the, um, the, sh the sense of, of everything being shattered, right, of the culture in a way the whole world being um, shattered in various ways. Um, another reaction was a kind of contempt for science and technology, a kind of reaction, a very strong reaction against it as having betrayed us in a certain way. Um, so there was a turn to a new kind of romanticism instead, that uh, the poets and the artists are the only ones who really have the answers to the meaning of life, and that we have to look elsewhere. We cannot look at the methods of the empirical sciences as um, giving our life any sense of meaning or purpose, value, and so forth. We have to uh, set science aside and look elsewhere. Um, and finally, I think, there was 
oddly enough, a sort of resurgent promotion of the sciences as the answer. Um, and this was, I think, part of the reaction against nationalism. The idea that it's, it was the nationalist um, sympathies of many people, the, the effort to build up our own people, our own culture as the preeminent one and so forth, that this was really important and these were very distinctive from what other people were doing and so forth. Um, and that that was the problem. This was the sort of thing that precipitates wars. And that if we just turn to the sciences, we will find something that is universal, that's rational. Every human being can, can agree about it and share in it. It's not particular to any one culture or people. Um, so maybe science will actually be our salvation. So it was not that science has betrayed us, just the opposite. Science will be our savior. Uh, it's that we didn't take the scientific method seriously enough. Um, the war was just a result of commitments to strange notions like the spirit of the folk or the spirit of the people. Um, and science obviously is not going to have any truck with those kind of notions. They are not empirical concepts. So there was um, a focus, there had been a focus on um, what's unique to a particular group or nation, maybe on a territorial claims that go way back into ancient times, centuries old claims to territory, uh, preserving, promoting certain kinds of traditions or customs. And uh, some thought the answer is to find a basis for action for um, political, a basis for society, for political developments and political forms that are going to be universal, rational, accessible to everybody, um, have that, that will have a kind of um, uh, e equalizing effect. Um, and that won't be uh, easily overturned then, because everybody will see how rational they are. And science will be the key to that. Now, uh, Bertrand Russell is a person who very much identified, I think, with this last camp, um, science as savior camp. Um, he wrote, we shall be wise to build our philosophy upon science, because the risk of error in philosophy is pretty sure to be greater than in science. Um, and he maintained, I think, this same position throughout his life, or is one of, the th one of the assumptions or the background things in a way that did not change, I think, for Russell, that philosophy should be modeled upon science and in various ways built on science. And so now we turn to Russell's uh, projects, his own philosophical projects. Um, first of all, he had a great aptitude for mathematics, uh, much more so than his friend G.E. Moore. And he was fascinated by the new developments in the sciences, especially in physics. So even though, along with Moore, he had also rejected Hegelian idealism uh, as being insufficiently grounded, obscure, and so forth, um, unlike Moore, he hoped to construct a better account of reality by employing the methods and tools of logic and mathematics. So mathematics for Russell was the kind of bedrock thing. Right. For Moore, it was common sense, but for Russell, it was mathematics and um, the new logic and the ways in which logic, it seemed at the time anyway, was going to be able to absorb even mathematics. could be expressed, all of the truths, mathematical truths could be expressed in logical, uh, as logical, in logical form and as logical theorems. Okay, we turn now to uh, Bertrand Russell's key commitments, philosophical assumptions, and the first of these is his quest for certainty. Russell says, I wanted certainty in the way in which people want religious faith. He himself recognized that in some ways it went beyond just a kind of rational or philosophical or scientific desire for certainty. He wanted certain, he needed certainty, you might say. Um, and so he was hoping that in mathematics and in logic, a realm where you do have absolute certainty, that that could somehow be a, a way of, it could be transferred to other problems. And we could apply those methods and get the same kind of certainty or close to it that we get in logic and mathematics with respect to other things. Um, secondly, Russell is an empiricist. Uh, he stands in that great uh, British tradition of empiricism that all of our knowledge comes through sense experience. Um, and beyond that, that, that sense experience as, as construed by the sciences, in other words, the kind of evidence that a scientist would admit as evidence for or against a particular theory, that that's the hard data, right? That's the hard data of experience. Everything else is soft data and um, can sort of be dispensed with. It's not important. Uh, thirdly, Russell is a realist. He's committed to realism. 
uh, he says, in fact, at, uh, toward the end of his life, he says, I still hold that any proposition other than a tautology, if it is true, is true in virtue of a relation to a fact, and that facts in general are independent of experience. On these matters, my views have not changed since I abandoned the teachings of Kant and Hegel. So in contrast then with Immanuel Kant, with, with the German philosopher Hegel, and their turn away from realism, their questioning about the reality of things in themselves, how we can know anything about them, or um, Hegel's just dispensing with um, a material world. Uh, Russell says, no, if, if the, th the items are true, if a proposition is true, it's because of the way the facts are. Right? So he, he still has a, a correspondence notion of truth. It's a correspondence between a statement or a claim and the way things are, uh, which he has maintained throughout his life. Um, and he thinks, as we've said, that science is going to be the key to finding out what's real. Um, a fourth assumption is a commitment to simplicity, or sometimes known as uh, Occam's razor, named after medieval philosopher William of Occam. And uh, Occam's, it's called a razor because Occam thought you should go with the simplest, postulate the simplest theory you can, right? Don't multiply entities beyond necessity. You don't um, bring in more things than you need in order to explain your experience. Um, the idea being that if you bring in unwarranted kinds of assumptions, uh, you're likely to make mistakes. You're more likely to make mistakes. So you should postulate the things you need to explain your experience, but um, you don't need to bring in additional entities. Uh, an example, I suppose, would be when, when kids decide that they don't need to postulate the existence of Santa Claus um, coming down the chimney in order to explain how the presents appear on Christmas morning. That um, a simpler hypothesis, and any of the people they already know, the parents, could be putting the presents there. And um, so they don't need to bring in a further assumption. Well, so by Occam's razor, that um, is let go. Um, a final commitment of Russell's is his, as we've talked about before, his commitment to logic as a kind of key to grasping the structure of reality. I mean, in a sense, you might see this as a kind of holdover from Hegel. Um, Hegel's view was that logic was, in fact, the, the unfolding of the absolute mind and so forth, was according to a kind of logical necessity. Um, and Russell has abandoned that, but he's still hoping that logic will be a kind of key to understanding the way the world works. Uh, in 1914, uh, right at the beginning of World War I, Russell gave a lecture in Boston on the topic, logic as the essence of philosophy, in fact. It's right, so one of his earlier talks. Um, there he said philosophy should focus on enumerating the different kinds of propositions, atomic propositions, molecular propositions, that presumably made up by the atomic ones, uh, general propositions, and so forth, determining what forms these could take. And this would enable us, he thought, to resolve many long-standing philosophical puzzles and problems. All right, so there is now, in a way I think there wasn't yet with G.E. Moore, now there's this assumption that not just we're going to start with the hard data and so forth, but that uh, if we pay careful attention, if we correct and purify our language, we'll be able to resolve somehow philosophical problems. Um, I, I suppose the negative way of putting it would be you're going to resolve them on the cheap. That is, you're not actually going to have to defund this kind of big theory or system or whatever, but you're going to show ways in which they were founded on a mistake or something like that. So uh, what, to take one example here, um, one of Ru Bertrand Russell's main contributions in philosophy was his theory of descriptions. And uh, he has a, an essay called The Theory of Descriptions, or On Description. Uh, what is the subject, the question was, what is the subject that's named uh, by the term the present king of France, or the phrase the present king of France, if somebody today would opine that the present king of France is bald? The present king of France is bald, that statement. Now, since France has no king at the present time, uh, maybe we instinctively want to say, well, that's false. All right, the sentence is false. But then, is it false? To say it's false, is that to say, well, is that because the present king of France has a full head of hair, so he's not bald? You think, well, no. I mean, there isn't a present king of France at all. You want to say, well, there's nothing really to be the subject of that sentence. So then, is it neither true nor false? It, it, it's not true, but it's not false either. Uh, that doesn't seem right. In fact, it violates a law of logic. Uh, the law of the excluded middle, that every sentence, every proposition, every assertion is either true or false. So, 
Anyway, it seems odd to say we don't know whether the present king of France is bald. As though, you know, we're waiting for the royal hairdresser to tell us for sure uh, whether he's wearing a toupee. Um, that's not it. So Russell felt that this has been misleading people. The, the, the way the sentence is phrased has been misleading to people for many years. And his solution was that when we look at descriptions like this, we need to distinguish between their sense or their meaning on the one hand and their reference on the other hand. The meaning of the description and then the reference would be what it picks out, what it refers to. Uh, it's because we know the meaning of the word raisin, for instance, that we can look and see whether our cookie has any raisins in it, right? Whether the word raisin refers to anything within the cookie boundaries, right? When we look closely, we find that some terms that seem to refer to real things actually fail to refer to anything real at all. So let's go back to our example of the present king of France uh, being bald. Right? What Russell wants to analyze this sentence in a, a different way so that the problem will in a way evaporate. Right? So he says when we say the present king of France is bald, we're, we're really saying something like this. There is an X, there is something, there is an X, such that X is now the king of France and nothing other than X is the king of France, so it's the, the one and only king of France, and X has baldness, has the property of being bald. Uh, this sentence is clearly false, Russell's translated sentence, um, because there is no existing thing is the king of France, right? So part of it was, remember the first part, there is an X such that X is the king of France, nothing other than X is the king of France, and X has baldness. So now we can see what the sentence is really saying, and we can say definitively it's false. All right? Now, um, on this kind of basis, Russell hoped to develop, uh, and Wittgenstein as well, the two of them in a way, around the time of World War I, uh, begin to develop this kind of uh, attempt at a perfect language, an ideal language. Um, Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, had been um, friends with Russell at Cambridge in the period before the war. Uh, Wittgenstein had written a um, very influential book, tract the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which came out in 19, wasn't published until 1921. Um, but the idea, the theory of meaning there was that the meaning of our sentences could be given by a primitive relationship between simple expressions, the atomic sentences, and their simple worldly bearers, which were the atomic states of affairs out in the world. So. Um, the most famous illustration was usually the sentence, the cat is on the mat. All right, it's got a very simple, it's a sentence with a very simple structure. Each word refers to something in the world of objects. You got a particular cat, let's call her Fluffy. Um, she's on a particular mat. We could name it Bob, all right? And there's a relation between them of spatial contiguity, right? Uh, fluffy on top of the mat. Um, now, as long as we limit ourselves to these kind of straightforward observation claims, uh, all will be well. But uh, it's not the only conversational gambit that people were prone to, to use and so forth. And it proved very difficult to, even with respect to those very basic ones, those atomic sentences, to, um, to connect them with things in the world, atomic things in the world. Um, while, while Wittgenstein took the simple objects, as it were, that are named by our terms to be um, material objects like cats, mats, brooms, and so forth. Uh, Russell followed more and took the simple objects to be sense data. So for Russell, the atomic sentence is not going to be the cat is on the mat, really. We have to change it, all right? Or we can't just say this is red, be, where this refers, um, you, you, well, you change, you don't say the cat is on the mat, you could talk about the, the, the cat-like sense datum, but I'm going to go with a simpler example, as he does many times, with just reporting the color of something. So again, he's not going to say the mat is red, but he'll say this is red, and this is supposed to pick out the sense datum. All right, so the sense datum is something you're immediately aware of, you're immediately aware of it's being red, and so you can't be wrong about it, right? When I say this is red, if it is, if I do, I'm appeared to in a certain way, I cannot be wrong about it. So that's the kind of certainty that Russell's looking for. Um, now he thinks there are also negative facts uh, that have to, we have to have negative facts to correspond to things like, you know, it's red but this is not green and so forth. So there's the negative state of affairs of the things not being green. Um, and maybe there's going to be general facts for sentences like um, all these sense data, plant-like sense data, 
will vanish, will cease to be, something like that. But it's a way of translating all your plants in your house are going to die, um, which if they're in my house is certainly going to happen. All right, now what's the advantage of Russell's view? Uh, the advantage is we have this kind of certitude, right? We're directly acquainted with the sense data. So the meaning of a term will be something we know immediately and with absolute certainty. We can verify all of our claims about the world directly ourselves. Um, and Russell wants a foundation for the sciences, but he wants one that yields certainty. And so this is his effort. Now the disadvantage is going to be that you have to translate sentences about Fluffy the cat into sentences about logical constructs out of sense data, all right? which is hard in the first place. It's just very difficult to do. Um, th this, when you say this, normally you think you're talking about the cat or the mat. But according to Russell, you're not. You're really talking about sense data, just as Moore said, the subjects of, of our sentences are already sense data. So um, you have to translate uh, talk about cats into sense data talk in the first place. And, and the further difficulty is going to be that scientists don't really want to talk about sense data. They want to talk about objective things. Right? They think they're explaining uh, something about the cat. They think they're explaining what's going on, uh, what are the elements in the actual lectern. They don't think they're just talking about sense data, right? which seem to be private and mental things. Um, now in the end, therefore, um, atomism bombed. And the reason it bombed uh, is kind of complicated, but part of the reason was it wasn't really adequate to the sciences themselves. Uh, scientific entities like electrons, atoms in fact, um, were not directly apprehended. They're not directly apprehended by us. All right? So the ultimate symbols in the scientific picture of the world aren't directly mapped onto the ultimate symbols of our immediate experience. So in the end then, these sense data that were the ultimate bedrock of certainty for Russell uh, are neither the ordinary objects of experience, they're neither the cats and mats and so forth that are out there, nor are they the objects that the physical sciences want to talk about, atoms, protons, and so forth. Um, their relationship, in fact, to either one of these kinds of objects remains pretty puzzling. All right. uh, secondly, there are many claims that seem to be truths about the facts of experience that don't analyze well into isolated atoms or names of definite particular objects. All right? If I say, for instance, of the actor Sean Connery, Sean Connery is bald, um, well, the term Sean Connery names somebody, or some groups of sense data, it seems. So, so far, so good. Uh, but what quality exactly is named by the term bald? How much hair must one lose in order to exhibit this quality? Uh, someone has said that you're bald when God isn't the only one who knows how many hairs are on your head. Um, be that as it may, it's still going to be leaving some leeway there as to how much hair you do have to have or lose in order to be bald. Um, now at first, Russell could dismiss, I suppose, this kind of case as unimportant for the sciences. They don't talk about properties like baldness. Uh, so its vagueness maybe is just to be expected. If it can't be cured, so what? So much the worse for ordinary terms like baldness. Um, but unfortunately, the same problem is going to arise for other terms, terms like mind, uh, for instance, um, terms like um, temperature or motion or whatever. Um, many of the concepts of the science is force. It's not easy to see exactly what is the empirical sense datum that's supposed to go with those concepts. Now, atomism didn't wholly die out um, this project of uh, developing a perfect language to map the structure of the world and so forth. It didn't wholly disappear, I think, until the demise of logical positivism. Because the positivists incorporated this project to some extent into their own program and tried to work out its implications over a number of years. Uh, they were loath to part with it, um, perhaps because many of them shared Russell's key commitments, the ones that we mentioned earlier on quest for certainty and simplicity, a strict empiricism, a strong tendency to seek salvation through logic and the natural sciences. And in fact, the failure of that program uh, was deeply disappointing to many, as it was, I think, deeply disappointing to Bertrand Russell himself. Um, in fact, Russell had gone through many uh, philosophical phases in the course of his life. Um, as I said, he lived to be, I think, 98 years old. Um, he, Russell was a person who was um, sensitive to many political causes and so forth. He was a pacifist. 
during both of the, of the great wars of uh, that century and um, stood up for many causes and was active, was sometimes jailed for his beliefs. Um, and uh, went, had a kind of tumultuous life in many respects. Um, but his, his, scientific, his philosophical views, in a sense, um, would, not give you that, would not give you that impression that, um, I mean, he seems to be the, the, the prime example, I suppose, of somebody that William James would call a tough-minded philosopher. But um, in an essay called My Mental Development, which is kind of an autobiographical essay um, in a book called The Philosophy of Bertrand Russell, uh, Russell says this, My intellectual journeys have been, in some respects, disappointing. When I was young, I hoped to find religious satisfaction in philosophy. Even after I had abandoned Hegel, the eternal Platonic world gave me something non-human to admire. I thought of mathematics with reverence and suffered when Wittgenstein led me to regard it as nothing but tautologies. I've always ardently desired to find some justification for the emotions inspired by certain things that seem to stand outside human life and to deserve feelings of awe. Those who attempt to make a religion of humanism, which recognizes nothing greater than man, do not satisfy my emotions. And yet I am unable to believe that, in the world as known, there is anything I can value outside human beings, and, to a much lesser extent, animals. And so my intellect goes with the humanists, though my emotions violently rebel. In this respect, the consolations of philosophy are not for me.